Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we come to the homework that was assigned this last week, we're going to take a deeper dive into many things that we will find in the following passages. It's interesting when we do to see what scripture has told us, but also that which we find within the words of the spirit of prophecy. Now, as we prepare for this, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more fully understand that which will soon be before us? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing, especially on these Sabbath hours. For we know that this is the time when many of your children will be asking for even further blessings. As we open your word today, please guide us. May your angels attend us. May our minds be enlightened so that we might understand more, more directly that which you would have us to know at this time in earth's history. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Forgive us of the times when we have not properly represented you, when our characters have not been that which are Christ-like. Help us to grow and to become the people that you would have give this final message to this world. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting and for those that will see them later. Direct us now, help us. For we need you, we need your spirit so that our characters may become representative for you at this time. For this we ask, for this we thank you, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, how many of us took time to look at the homework that was sent out this last week. I looked at it, but I can't say I did everything that I wanted to do. It would have taken so much time and effort. Okay. <clears throat> I managed to get through it twice. Okay. Thank you. I find it interesting that in this situation, that Mrs. White has made the following verses important for us to consider at this time. <clears throat> now, as she writes here, the end of all things is at hand and iniquity abounds. Because men have transgressed the law and have broken the everlasting covenant given on condition of obedience and because of continual transgression. Then she provides the verses. There we have the prophecies of the state of our world just prior to the second coming of the Lord thy God. The world will become more and more under the sway of seducing spirits as they turn away from God and his righteous government. Men professing godliness will indulge their own traits of character. Unless they are conscientiously under the control of God, 
they will become self-indulgent and self-centered. A very correct <clears throat> description of many characters that we are seeing today. Now, in preparing for this study and for our time together, I ran into several documents, one of which I will share with you today. Then we need to take a little deeper dive into Isaiah 59. So, this document, which Mrs. White had entitled Resisting Temptation, she wrote on December 10th of 1889. So, this was written just a little over a year after the Minneapolis camp meeting. But this was also a document that came up as I was preparing for this. So to share this with you, wherein ye greatly rejoice, now though, though now for a season, if, be, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 6, 7. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James 1, 2-4. The temptations that assail the children of God are to be regarded as the outworking of the wrath of Satan against Christ, who gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins and redeemed us by his blood. Satan is filled with wrath against Jesus, but he cannot hurt the Savior except by conquering those for whom Christ died. He knows that when through his devices souls are ruined, the Savior is wounded. Much of what she writes here is important for us to consider now. The heavenly universe is watching with the deepest interest the conflict between Christ and the person of his saints and the great deceiver. So where is this conflict? Where is this conflict? It's on earth. But who is it between? Jesus and Satan. As she writes here, this conflict is between Christ in the person of his saints and the great deceiver. It is between those that are on the front line. Because if our adversary overcomes us, this hurts Christ. Those who recognize and resist temptation are fighting the Lord's battles. How much encouragement does this give us today? To such are given the commendation. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. James 1.12 Endurance of temptation means the cultivation of patience. The tempted harassed soul, cannot trust in his own strength of purpose. Feeling his utter helplessness, he flees to the stronghold, saying, My Savior, I cast my helpless soul upon thee. The fiercer the temptation, the more strongly he clings to the mighty one. <clears throat> Who else do we find in Scripture that clung to Christ? Isn't it Jacob? Yes. 
are we beginning to experience in the temptations and trials that are coming before us the time of Jacob's trouble? I'm saying beginning because it's yet to come for us. This, oh, man. this we need to understand because we need to experience what it means to cling to Christ. By faith, he passes the temptation over to Christ and leaves it there. Faith is in the Savior's strength, makes him more than a conqueror. It is the miracle working power of Jesus that arms the Christian with strength to overcome as Christ overcame. <clears throat> How many times, brothers and sisters, have we felt that we have failed when we've taken things into our own hands to handle our own way? How many times have we not handed this over to Christ and left it there? Temptation is not sin unless it is cherished. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, will fill the soul with peace and abiding trust. <clears throat> When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59, 19. Here is our link back into the homework. A few hours ago, I listened to the complaints of a distressed soul. Satan came to her in an, unex in an unexpected way. I can testify to this. She thought that she had blasphemed the Savior because the tempter kept putting into her mind the thought that Christ was only a man, no more than a good man. She thought that Satan's whisperings were the sentiments of her own heart, and this horrified her. She thought that she was denying Christ, and her soul was in an agony of distress. I assured her that these suggestions of the enemy <clears throat> were not her own thoughts, that Christ understood and accepted her, and that she must treat these suggestions as holy from Satan, and that her courage must rise with the strength of the temptation. She must say, I am a child of God. I commit myself, body and soul, to Jesus. I hate these vain thoughts. I told her not to admit to a moment that they originated with her, not to allow Satan to wound Christ by plunging her into unbelief and discouragement. <clears throat> How many times have we found ourselves discouraged? Too many to count, probably. Amen. What are we being told here? When we hold on to discouragement, we are holding on to unbelief that Christ cannot help us, that we are alone. And what is this allowing our adversary to do? To wound Christ. As it was said of those that attended the Minneapolis meeting. When they rejected the message of Jones and Wagner, had Christ himself appeared before the brethren at that meeting, they would have crucified him afresh. By their unbelief, they chose to do that 
to the Savior. To those who are tempted, I would say, do not for a moment acknowledge Satan's temptations as being in harmony with your mind. Turn from them as you would from the adversary himself. <clears throat> Satan's work is to discourage the soul. Christ's work is to inspire the heart with faith and with hope. Satan seeks to unsettle our confidence. He tells us that our hopes are built on false premises rather than the sure, immutable word of him who cannot lie. Satan tells us that our understanding of July 18th is a false premise. The oldest, most experienced Christians have been assailed by Satan's temptations, but through trust in Jesus, they have conquered. So may every soul who looks in faith to Christ. What a promise is this? Is this something that we can rely upon? Absolutely. A man cannot put his feet in the path of holiness without evil men and evil angels uniting against him. Evil angels will conspire with evil men to destroy the servants of God. Those who are rebuked for their evil thoughts will hate the reprover of sin and try to wrench him from the service of Christ. The conflict may be long and painful, but we have the pledged word of the eternal that Satan cannot conquer us unless we submit to his control. <clears throat> what does this say to you at this time? Is this not clear enough? Christ was crucified as a deceiver, yet he was the light and the life of the world. He endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Can we measure the love of God? Paul declares that it passes knowledge, Ephesians 3.19. Then shall we who have been made partakers of the heavenly gift be careless and indifferent, neglecting the great salvation wrought out for us? Shall we allow ourselves to be separated from Christ and thus choose, just then thus lose the eternal reward, the great gift of everlasting life? Note, please, allowing ourselves to be separated from Christ. How much like it in this with the comment that the bride will not make herself ready? Are we choosing at this time to be separated from Christ? Are we choosing to forego? the promised everlasting life for this life on this earth? Shall we not accept the enmity which Christ has placed between man and the serpent? Shall we not eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God, which means to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? Or shall we become earthly, eating the serpent's meat, which is selfishness, hypocrisy, evil surmising, envy, and covetousness. We have a right to say in the strength of Jesus Christ, I will be a conqueror. I will not be overcome by Satan's devices. What do you think of this? What is your thought about what has just been read? Oh, 
was a great encouragement to me. I mean, I've been experiencing some of what what is being described here. And I found out you know, the only solution is to completely cast myself on Christ and ask him to come in and fight Satan for me. If we're not willing to turn these situations over to Christ, then are we not choosing to let our garments remain spotted? Yes. So this that was written December 10th of 1889 became manuscript 31. <clears throat> And it's noted that this is from Diary Fragments, Manuscript 31, 19th November of 1911. Does that mean anything to anybody? <clears throat> Could you repeat that, please? This became, this that Mrs. White wrote December 10th of 1889 became noted as diary fragments, was typed out as manuscript 31, 19th November, 1911. Does this mean anything to anybody? Just the last date there. Why? Uh, the 9-11 in it? Consider this. If I place this in strictly numbers, <clears throat> the date would be 1-9-11 in the year 1-9-11. Uh, that's a repeat. <laughs> that's, that's, that's midnight. Where the go ahead? It'd be a doubling, yeah. Yes, it is. It's definitely <clears throat> here. We are needing to receive this encouragement as the five wise virgins had their encouragement of the oil in their lamp that they were prepared for the wedding feast. We needed this to help us understand that in resisting temptation, in the manner in which this temptation is resisted, does not wound Christ, but allows us to come off as more than conquerors. Now, <clears throat> From the homework, I took a look directly at Isaiah 59. To be very specific, in considering this passage from scripture, I found it very interesting that there are at least 14 unpublished documents, documents that had not been fully published or at all published that are connected with Isaiah 59. we now have them for study and for our admonition. Isaiah 59 shows the calamities of the Jews, not owing to want of saving power of God, but to their own enormous sins. The calamities of the movement that's not owing to the saving power of God, 
but to the sins that have been retained. By verse 16, we find that salvation comes of God alone. <clears throat> and by verse 20, we are presented with the covenant of the Redeemer. How important is it for us today to accept salvation and to accept in full the covenant that has been offered? On Wednesday, June 14th, 1899, Mrs. White writes, I thank the Lord for a good night's rest. I slept until half past 2 a.m. <clears throat> that for her was a good night's rest. It was a cold morning, but I did not build a fire. After three o'clock, I took my pen in hand and employed it earnestly until a quarter to seven. Dr. Carroll called upon me, soliciting an interview. We conversed together in regard to the future prospects of the sanitarium. The General Conference Bulletin gave us great encouragement that something would be done. But at the present time, we can only say our disappointment is great, and we only trust in God. He can and will work for us. I feel the most severely over the disappointment of our faithful workers in the sanitarium, who are working under great inconvenience. We are telling the whole story to the Lord, although he knows all the matter. Yet it is our duty to ask counsel of the Lord and not be in any way discouraged. <clears throat> I devoted some time to conversation with Dr. Carroll, but the future seems cloudy. May our Lord be gracious and help us to do his ser him service acceptably. The sanitarium in this country, in New South Wales, will, if we can establish it, be a means of bringing light to many souls who are now in darkness and know not the truth as it is revealed in the world. In the we, word. In the word, excuse me. We see in every church, there must be a true line of education in all points. The trumpet must give a certain sound, proclaiming the gospel message for this time. The ministry of the word is essential. As the truth takes hold of the heart and the character, it beautifies and elevates and ennobles individuality of character. And yet, like the branches of the true vine, the creative wisdom of God has a marked variety in nature, and there will be a variety in the work in the, in the, work the church is designed to accomplish. Diversity of talent will be seen because the word of God speaks, instructing in every age, but no less so in 1899. The great and important work is the missionary work to be done in building up the structure of the human habitations, and the restoration will go forward in the divine lines and by diversity of instrumentalities. There are sharp, strong messages to be born. There are to be sons of consolation, but the message of the third angel must be carried, the banner of truth uplifted, for conversion is in it. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, Isaiah chapters 59 and 60. Christ came to this world to save people over whom Satan was exercising his power. He came to work out the purposes which had been planned in the councils of heaven. God's vineyard had been worked by the unrighteous scribes and Pharisees, but Christ came to set things in their right light. In the 59th, 60th, 61st, and 62nd chapters of Isaiah, his work is defined. For Zion's sake, he said, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteous thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. 
Isaiah 62, 1. <clears throat> Every one of us may have a work to do to improve ourselves to the best of our ability. And if we will endeavor to do it, the Lord of heaven has his angels right beside us to help us. <clears throat> Is this not a major promise for us to accept? I want to tell you we have a compassionate Savior and a precious Lord who did not withhold that savior to save the world. Will you appreciate it? Will you work to the point? It is said that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repenteth than over 90 and nine that need no repentance. Did they not need it? Yes, but they would not acknowledge it. They would have their own way anyhow. I want to tell you that the end is near, and when I have been obliged to give up for a time, yet the Lord has sustained me, and I can travel and speak to the congregations. I want to say, let every one of us search the scriptures. Let us study the 58th and 59th chapters of Isaiah, and we will have a great lesson to learn. I am preparing for the future immortal life, and I have thought every now and then, when I made my efforts to reach the people, how can I reach the people? Well, I would speak and I would pray that the Lord would give me voice and intelligence that I might reach them. And I have been greatly blessed. Manuscript 81, 19, 12. Isaiah 59, 1, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Think of the horror of human beings dying because those placed in charge of the means of relief proved unfaithful to their trust. They bartered the means of life for selfish gain and let their fellow beings to perish. Many inquire, can this be a fact? It is, and yet it seems almost impossible. Do we see this occurring within the world and church around us. And in a higher sense, this great sin has been and is being repeated. The world was perishing in sin. Its condition is described in the 59th chapter of Isaiah. It was seen in heaven that men were perishing. And the compassion of God was stirred. He devised a means of relief, and at what an infinite cost. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My brethren, unless the Holy Spirit is actuating you as a vital principle, Unless you are observing its promptings, depending on its influences, laboring in the strength of God, my message to you from God is, you are under a delusion which may prove fatal to your souls. You must be converted. You must receive light before you can give light. Place yourselves under the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. Then you can say with Isaiah, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. 
Isaiah 60, verse 1. You must cultivate faith and love. The Lord's arm is not shortened, <clears throat> that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. Isaiah 59, 1. Seek the Lord, rest not until you know that Christ is your Savior. Do we wish to be under such a delusion that is faithful to our souls? I wish you, my brethren, to bear in mind that Bible religion never destroys human sympathy. True Christian courtesy needs to be taught and acted to be carried into all your intercourse with your brethren and with worldlings. There is far more need of love and courtesy in our families than is now revealed. There is far more need of love and courtesy in this movement, in this church, than is now revealed. When our ministering brethren shall drink in the spirit of Christ daily, they will be truly courteous and will not consider it weakness to be tender hearted and pitiful. For this is one of the principles of the gospel of Christ. Christ's teaching softened and subdued the soul. The truth received into the heart will work a renovation in the soul. Those who love Jesus <clears throat> will love the souls for whom he died. The truth planted in the heart will reveal the love of Jesus and its transforming power. Anything harsh, sour, critical, domineering is not of Christ, but proceeds from who? Satan. Yes. Anything harsh, sour, critical, domineering is not of Christ, but proceeds from Satan. Coldness, heartlessness, want of tender sympathy are leavening the camp of Israel. What lesson had we learned here? When had this leavening entered into the camp of Israel. Did it not enter into the camp of Israel when the Midianites came in to take the eye of the children of Israel from God to introduce the worship of their gods? If these evils are permitted to strengthen as they have done for some years in the past, our churches will be in a deplorable condition. What does this say about us today? What are we seeing here? A lot of changes in order. Yes. Agreed. And where does the change begin? With me. With me. Can we not all say that today? Amen.
Yes, yes. We are watching and waiting, expecting to see a more thorough, decided missionary spirit will take families out of Battle Creek and out of the churches and send them forth to labor in the fields that are all ready for harvest. This part of the field needs to be worked. Shall we give up Wellington, Dundin, Christ Church, and Auckland as hopeless enterprises? Shall we give up Melbourne and the cities of Australia? where there are many honest souls and pour all the means and efforts upon American cities. It seems as if I could hear the words that were addressed to the apostle. I have much people in this city. And it was a most forbidding outlook, a city given up to all appearances, to unbelief, to skepticism, to infidelity and heathenism. And the most profligate, that was upon the earth. I know God's will is not done in this matter. Time is narrowing up. The same spirit of opposition in regard to the Sunday law will make as deep a mark here as in America. God's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. But who is it that has the Lord's money? All the efforts we can make are useless without money and workers. We must not have our hands tied. It is so essential to get the leaven into the meal. And Christ is making his superhuman efforts. To Satan. Keep... Excuse me? Satan is making. Yes. And Satan is making his superhuman efforts to keep the leaven out by keeping the door closed. I feel intensely over this subject. Shall the warnings and the good news, the glad tidings of great joy, of what is truth to be complained to the people, Christ, by the virtue of his blood that cleanseth all sin, is drawing them to obedience, and no one is at work in these places. This next manuscript, manuscript 28, 1900. The Lord Jesus represents the whole of heaven's treasures, which have been committed to him to impart to the church in rich, full currents of love and grace and power. If an earthly father being evil gives his hungry child bread, not a stone, a fish, not a serpent, will God, being good and righteous, deny his children the gift of the Holy Spirit? We spoke upon this last night. What is the gift of the Holy Spirit? How can we know the latter rain is falling as it was falling in 1893? Upon his children, he bestows his blessings abundantly. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. The reason why the churches do not understand the word of God is given in the 58th chapter of Isaiah. In this chapter are laid down the conditions of receiving God's blessings. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, if thou drawth out the soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like springs of water, whose water fail not.
we are given the opportunity to understand the word of God. We are given a warning in the 58th chapter of Isaiah, but we are also seeing the promises of the 59th. And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. If thou shalt turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Are we not to believe in the word of God? Can not the Lord accomplish exactly what he says he will do? Yes, he will have it accomplished. If men would receive the word of God just as it reads... Power from on high would be given them. Instead of working against God by their disobedience, they would seek to win souls to obedience. What does this say to us today? Are we receiving the word of God just as it reads? We're supposed to. But are we doing it? But it shows that we ourselves are, as you pointed out earlier, struggling with the idea of self. Because when we're drawn away by our own lusts, then we sin. And then we prove that we're saying to ourselves that the word, the word of God does not have the power to save. But until we submit ourselves wholly to the word of God, that it is almost impossible for us to reach out and do the work of trying to soul save because we're sitting ourselves. We're not the example that they should see because we're struggling with sin ourselves. How else do you see this struggle with sin, sister? I, I see it in my own life when I with the, the idea of appetite. And it's, I've come a far away when I look at my appetite, but at the same time, it's, as she says, you don't put a, a nut in even between your meals. And sometimes with shift work that I do that. And then it's trying to teach somebody about appetite. And then you're remembering your own issues with appetite. And so that hinders your work. But it, it's to rely wholly on, on the word. As you read earlier, it's giving the temptation to Christ. And when I saw that, it's like, oh, that's a power and a promise that I can do. Give it to Christ and leave it there because of my own self, I can't do it. But with Christ through me, and it's really submitted because sometimes I've had those hard battles where it's like, okay, tonight is a death of me because there is no way I'm going to survive the night. And you wake up the next morning, it's like, hey, I'm alive. That battle, the Lord won. And it's it's like losing an arm and a leg when you really fight those battles. Are we not in an ocean of sin? We are when you look at it in the context of the world, yes. Many of us in this ocean of sin don't know how to swim. 
how can a drowning man or woman save another person that's drowning? You can to let him hold of the preserver. But how can this occur? If we if if the if the life preserver is the word of God and we're holding on to it, can we not call others to hold on to it as well? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yesterday, I received a telephone call. I missed the call, but I called right back. I was asked to join in prayer for a young woman with the name of Tabitha. Now, apparently, this, this young woman who had been a member of the Adventist church had not just walked away from faith, but had chosen to leave herself under the control of the adversary. She accepted what she had been told. She accepted what the world told her was necessary in order to be protected. This young lady, not apparently not yet 40, was in a hospital because her blood had now coagulated to such a point that it was difficult for her body to pump it. Her parents were concerned. Her friends were concerned. Prayers were offered for her. Many are choosing not to receive the word of God just as it reads. Many are choosing to say, I'm a good person. And as a good person, yes, I make mistakes. So I've had an affair. So I've turned my back on others but I'm still a good person. Therefore, I will be saved. If men would receive the word of God just as it reads, power from on high would be given them. If we are not willing to receive the word of God just as it reads, how can we receive this power? Yeah. Is it not clear that the power that would be given to those that will not receive the word of God as it reads, that this power is coming from another source? We're not to work against God. We are to work with him. Amen. Can we work with God if we are disobedient to his word? No. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Or as the alternate reading would state, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have made him hide his face from you that he will not hear. Do we want God to turn from us today?
are are those sins that we've had so cherished that we want to be separated from God? Brother Haskell, we must pray more in simple, humble contrition of the soul. We must exercise faith, teach the people how to have faith. I long to speak to the people in the yearly meetings east. I long to tell them, behold him, behold him, the man of Calvary, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I long to tell the people that all the exalted privileges granted them all the love and tender mercy of our God, all the warnings of God's messengers, all the labor and enlightenment of his grace through holy men will not save one of them. They must save their own souls by their own righteousness. All the light of present truth will not prevent them from falling away from their exalted privilege and losing all they have once held sacred and valuable. It is necessary for them to be instant in prayer and to live a life of humiliation and constant living faith. I want to say to them, your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hid his face from you. Your maker has not forsaken you. Jesus has linked you by his own body to the infinite one, and his faithfulness will never fail. His promises are more sure than the everlasting hills. But you have departed from God. You have forsaken the fountain of living waters, and you have distrusted his love. You have had every spiritual advantage. The precious, clear light of truth has shone upon your pathway, but you have not rendered corresponding obedience and kept yourselves in the love of God. This very love, which should have been a blessing, has become a curse. We are to see fearfully trying times, but need not despond. Trust in the living God. They that hear the, the Lord and work righteousness, he will be to them as a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. I would tell them that the most precious blessings and the most exalted privileges are prepared for and promised to them that love the truth and obey it in the love of it. Oh, let us all determine to crucify self and to imitate God. Are we to hold on to self? No, no. We are to crucify self. We are to express in our own lives the holiness of God, showing his forbearance, his tenderness, his compassion and love, thus communicating his attributes. Then we shall no longer judge from the sight of the eye or the hearing of the ear. We shall bear in mind that we are yoked up with Christ to draw with him and to do the greatest possible amount of good. Our work may not be appreciated. We may be misjudged, falsified, and mistreated by those who claim to be Christians but we are to look to Christ and follow him. Christians are to walk even as he walked. They are to have the mind of Christ to possess that faith which works by love and purifies the soul. He who is conformed to the image of Christ will possess his grace and be helpful to strengthen every brother in the faith. 
Are we to strengthen brothers and sisters in the faith by casting them out? Are we to strengthen them by criticizing them? Are we to strengthen them by rumor and innuendo? As she continues, no harsh or bitter words that discourage the soul will fall from his lips. When we're confronted with harsh and bitter words, when we are confronted with rumor and innuendo, are these coming from those that are holding and conforming themselves to the image of Christ? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Wherefore, lift up the hands that fall down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Here is a work which you are authorized to have an earnest zeal to accomplish, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many are defiled. Here we are told to see Isaiah 1 and 2. All who have a vital connection with God are guided by his counsel. United in church capacity, they give themselves to do Christ's work. If we will open the door to Jesus, he will come in and abide with us. Our strength will always be reinforced by his actual representative, the Holy Spirit. Will the Holy Spirit abide where there is one idol in a life? Said more simply, can the Holy Spirit abide where there is one cherished idol? No. Can we then be unified if we are holding on to idols? Can we be ready for the outpouring of the spirit that Christ so longs to give to us? But whenever the church unites with them, a man who is without earnestness and sanctified moral purpose, they have a hindrance that weakens moral power and turn souls away from faith and love and trust in God. Whenever anything is encountered that is contrary to his mind, such a one will reveal his true spirit. In counsels, he does unlawful acts, pronounces unjust sentences, and through his influences, decisions are made that are entirely contrary to God's will and ways. Thus, he proves himself disloyal to God. He is neglected to follow the rules which Christ has given, and he works according to the principles of the world. If others sit by and let these things pass, God charges the sin upon them also. It is a duty to keep our offices of publication pure, 
that there shall be no conniving to do injustice in the business transactions. Here we are also to see Review and Herald, 23rd of February of 1897. The 58th chapter of Isaiah points out the evil and the remedy for the diseased soul. Let this chapter be received as warning and instruction, for the Lord God of Israel calls for a decided reformation, not only among the young people, but among the instructors of the young. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. A decided change is called for. The work of repentance and reformation has not gone deep and thorough. How complete is this work of reformation? Deep and thorough. What does that mean to us today? Inspiration declares the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? The God of heaven is of pure eyes that to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity. Habakkuk 1.13 it is not because he's unwilling to forgive that he turns from the transgressor. It is because the sinner refuses to make use of the abundant provisions of grace that God is unable to deliver from sin. Here again, we're being shown of our great need. It is only when we accept our great need that we can show to others how they, as well as we, can have access to that which God would have us to obtain. We bear our testimony to the impenitent. Beloved, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. The Lord now tells us, that which interposes between the souls that are impenitent and himself. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Is it not best now, just now, to seek the Lord and purify from your heart and character every sin that defileth? Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. All who are oppressed under a sense of your sins, for there is hope for you in God. There are those that are in health. There are those that can do missionary work, earnest missionary work. How much are we doing to awaken the sensibilities of men and women in our world? The Lord wants us to cooperate with him. From this that I have read, he wants you to wake up. <clears throat> Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. Now here is a work of repentance. And those that feel that they are not right with God, don't let a day go unless you make a thorough consecration of your hearts to God. You cannot afford it. It is too late in the day to trifle with, those, with these eternal realities. We want to see the king in his beauty. We want to behold his righteousness. 
Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. Now, this is our blessed assurance. It does not come from human assertions. It comes from the living God to his people. Verse 3, to thy life. <clears throat> this is just what we want, Jew and Gentile. We want all to come to the light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice. None pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth. And that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. Is this to be said of us today? The way of peace they knew not. And there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither doth judgment overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in the darkness. Now, just as a question, how did Sister White refer to this about Isaiah 59? What did she say at the very beginning of this week's homework? Is this not a prophecy? Let's return there. Mrs. White says, there we have the prophecies of the state of our world just prior to the second coming of the Lord thy God. Do we not see these conditions all the way around us? We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places like dead men. God is willing to give us light. He's willing to help us understand. What's keeping us from understanding? Self-will. We're holding on to things that we should not. Self has been interposed between ourselves and our Savior. 
we are more willing to stand in the filthy garments of our own making than we are to accept that Christ offers us his righteousness. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Does God lie? No. Can God lie? No. Where do lies come from? Satan. From Father the of all lies. So in transgressing and lying against the Lord, whose banner are we standing under? Not the right one. Okay. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth far off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Courts of justice are corrupt. Rulers are actuated by desire for gain and love of sensual pleasure. Intemperance has beclouded the, the faculties of many, so that Satan has almost complete control of them. <clears throat> Jurists are perverted, they are bribed, deluded. Drunkenness and revelry, passion, envy, dishonesty of every sort are represented among those who administer the laws. Justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. Isaiah 59, 14. The awakening power of God the molding influence of the Holy Spirit is needed by all who in any way bear responsibilities in the Lord's work. We are being awakened to the power of God. But the influence of the Holy Spirit cannot be provided as long as there's one idol remaining within our soul temple. Without this, they are unfit for the work and should be dismissed. If they have not understood their work and the qualifications essential, <clears throat> it is vain to expect that they will do in the future, that clear, decided, forcible work which God requires. Please notice, Moses said, Exodus 18, 16, when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. This work is still to be done. And if the men who now bear responsibilities will not do it, then it must be committed to others. The Lord's work must be carried forward without guile, hypocrisy, or covetousness. In his instruction to Moses, the Lord very plainly set forth the character of those who were to fill important positions as counselors. They are to be able men, such as fear God, men of faith, 
hating covetousness. The Lord's counsel has been strangely neglected. There are men in, in places of holy trust who, when reproved, have cared not for it. Some who for years have stood as counselors have boldly stated that they would not receive the testimonies given. In triumph, they have declared that many of our most responsible men have lost faith in the messages coming from Sister White. Thus, the rejectors of light have been strengthened in their unbelief, feeling that they had quite a strong confederacy. This was written in 1896. Do we see this yet today? Are there those within the church that have chosen to reject the testimonies and the messages of Sister White? Have there been those within the movement that have chosen to set aside that which Mrs. White presents as prophecies for our time, stating that these are not for us, but were for a time in the deep past. Men who have had the light have walked contrary to the light. These words are appropriate. Truth has fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter. The malaria of unbelief has been diffusing its deathly atmosphere throughout the ranks nigh and afar off. All this has been stated plainly, yet for years matters have been left unchanged. Can the Lord's favor be expected under such circumstance? What say you today? Can the Lord's favor be expected under conditions such as this? Nay. Nay. So what are we to do? Keep our eyes on Jesus and do his will. Are we also to see the light, walk within the light, so that we may receive more light? And I agree, we must keep our eyes on Christ because the moment we take our eyes from Christ, we fall from the path. The religion of error and superstition bore its fruit, bigotry, cruelty, falsehood, and murder. These were exercised on the person of the only begotten Son of God. The priests tried in every way to entrap Christ, to find in him something that they could use against him. But notwithstanding the fact that they hired the ignorant tools of the enemy to bear a testimony, which they had put in their mouths, nothing was found in Christ worthy of condemnation. Three times the judge declared, I find no fault in him. Three times. Did Caesar's representative find no fault in Christ? Yet instead of protecting Christ as an innocent man and thus earning the reputation of being a just and considerate ruler, Pilate gave him up into the hands of the mob. The only begotten son of God was placed on trial. But it was a mock trial from beginning to end. It was shown to the world that the religion of the Jewish teachers was a religion of oppression. It proved unable 
to reform them. I'm sorry. It was not my intent to speak over you. What were you saying? Tradition and rights of no value whatever were exalted above the word of God. Truth indeed had fallen in the streets and equity could not enter. The religious rulers rejected and condemned him who was the light of the world, the one who shone amidst the moral darkness, and who in a moment could have struck off his fetters. Christ was obliged to tell them that by their resistance of righteousness, they had served their day and that the vineyard would be given to other husbandmen. Claiming to have the only true religion of the world, they turned from the truth itself and crucified one who was the truth because he bore witness against their evil works. Light shone amidst the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. Injustice and fraud lifted themselves in triumph, and Satan was pleased with the success of his plans. Christ gave the lesson of the blighted fig in order to teach an important lesson. For the time he invested the tree with moral qualities that made it the expositor of truth. Pretentious in appearance, it stood in the orchard flaunting its rich foliage as if fruit in abundance might be found on it. But Christ searched from the topmost bough to the lowest branches and found nothing but leaves. He pronounced the curse upon it, and the next morning it was found to have withered away under the curse of him who created it. Master, said Peter, behold the fig tree that thou cursest, it is withered away. May this not be said of us today. Now, our time is nearing its close. There is much that Mrs. White has declared regarding the prophecies that we will see in Isaiah 59 and its relationship to Zephaniah and Haggai and all of these other so-called minor prophets. Have you any comment or thought for what we have addressed today. Have you any questions? Then let us. Right, when I, yes. Sorry, right. When I was looking at the book, I did copy down some verses but one of them that really stood out to me was psalm 145 15 about the eyes of all look upon thee and thou givest them their meat in due season and i was thinking of eyes in in god's word meaning the prophets right the seers okay and if we're looking to christ he will indeed give us meat in due season and what we've heard just this morning is meat in due season and i hope and pray that it's going to be renewing us <laughs> like it's a big spanking and it's it's casting a searchlight on our hearts and there's a lot of corruption I know in me and I'm sure in everybody else and we need to just ask him to remove it and and help us to be more like him restored in him it's our only hope Amen. it is indeed There's a lot we have yet to address and there's a lot we have yet to share. But I'm sure that given that Theodore and Heidi are going to be heading to another meeting, 
that we need to give them the time so that they may have the time to make to this other meeting. So we will close now in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the warnings that have been given. We thank you for the examples that have been provided. We thank you that these messages, though unpublished before, are now available for us to listen, to, to learn, and to understand so that we might understand more of what we need to do that we might understand how we might be prepared to become the living stones of your glorious temple. Direct us now. Be with us. Help us so that we may indeed resist temptation. So that we may become more than conquerors. We ask, Father, for your blessing, for traveling mercies, for Heidi and Theodore. We ask us, Father, that you'll bring us again together so that we may learn more from you and consider the lessons that you would have us to know at this time. For this, we thank you, and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.